Okay, well, it is 10.02, and I think that's as good a time to start as ever. Um, good morning, and thank you all so much for being here. It's wonderful to scroll through the participants and see some familiar names and um, some new names as well. My name is Marika van der Steenhoven, and I am the Special Collections Education and Outreach Librarian for the Bowdoin College Library. Today, I am delighted to welcome you to our first program in our series, Beyond the Reading Room Archive, excuse me, Beyond the Reading Room Archives in the World. Beyond the Reading Room Archives in the World is a virtual lecture series featuring artists, scholars, and Bowdoin alumni who rely on archival research for their work. Each speaker has a connection to Bowdoin Bowdoin Library's George J. Mitchell Department of Special Collections and Archives, either having consulted our collections or having their own work represented therein. I wanna thank the Bowdoin College Library for supporting this program series, um, to Tony Sprague for his technical support and for Alumni Relations for helping us spread the word about this program. Today, we are joined by the fabulous book artist, Maureen Cummins, and I'm so excited to introduce you to her work. Um, and I also hope that you will join us for future programs in this series. Next Thursday, we will be joined by Pamela Zabala, who is Bowdoin class of 2017. Um, Pamela will be giving a talk entitled, Learning from the Past, an Archival Exploration of Bowdoin's Racial History wherein she will highlight the role of archival research in her 2017 honors project on incidents of racial bias at Bowdoin. She will discuss how access to archival materials allowed her to contextualize the incidents at the center of her project within the broader historical context of race and racism at Bowdoin. She will also discuss some of her current graduate research on race and discuss the pros and cons of using archives in sociological research. On November 16th, literary scholar Susan F. Beagle will share an illustrated lecture entitled Harriet Beecher Stowe, The Pearl of Oars Island and Maine Summer Tourism. And then the final talk in our series is on December 3rd, and that will feature Don Westfall, who is Bowdoin class of 1972, who will be talking about the extensive research he has been conducting in the college archives on the history of the college's land acquisition in the state of Maine. I encourage you to join us for all of these programs and others, including our monthly Audubon Double Elephant Folio Birds of America page turning, these are all free programs, they are open to the public, and they are occurring virtually. You can register for these programs and check out what we've been up to in special collections and archives at our news and events site, which I am going to pop into the chat uh, right now. Look at that, there it is. So be sure to check that out. I am so honored and excited to present today's program, um, a conversation with book artist Maureen Cummins. Maureen has cranked presses from California to the Eastern Arctic and has produced over 40 limited edition artist books, many based on historical research. She has created projects based on slave narratives, the Salem witch trials, the gendered history of lobotomies, and interviews with Syrian and Iraqi refugees. Cummins currently lives and works in Mount Tremper, New York. Hello, Maureen. <laughs> Hello, Marika. Thank you so much for inviting me. I oh. also want to thank uh, Kat Stefko, who's been so supportive uh, for so many, many years of my work. The Bowdoin College Library has been collecting artist books since the early 1990s, and we currently hold over 600 examples of works created by artists from Maine and beyond. And we are delighted to be the caretakers of uh, 10 of Maureen's artist books. Our audience today is comprised of an incredible range of people, from students to noted and accomplished book artists. So before we dig into our conversation, I wanna offer up a working definition of what an artist book is. Um, those familiar with this genre know that there is much debate amongst practitioners and scholars about defining the parameters of this fluid art form. So I will offer up just the most basic delineation. 
An artist book is a work of art wherein form, content, and concept bear equal importance in the transference of information. The book artist explores and challenges the limits of what we might understand a book to be and engages with the temporal nature of reading. Of course, I welcome you all in the audience today to share your own definitions. Maureen Cummins' artist books at Bowdoin serve as a crucial component of our instruction program. Students from various academic departments engage with her work um, as art practitioners, and this is where I want to offer a shout out to the Bowdoin Printmaking Studios here today, um, uh, student historians and student sociologists, amongst many others. As the education librarian, it has been an honor to facilitate student use of these books. And personally, I have absolutely cherished the time I have gotten to spend with Maureen's books. Um, her work is thought provoking, visceral, playful, and so much more. And it truly has been even more of an honor spending time in conversation with her over the past few weeks. Um, what we're going to do next is I'm going to share excerpts from our conversation overlaid with videos of the books in consideration. Um, we'll be talking specifically about three of Maureen's artist books. And after this, um, Maureen will join us again for questions. And we've scheduled ample time for this. So feel free to queue up your questions in the Q&A forum. Tony um, has also enabled a voting action. So if you see someone else's question that you really want answered, you should feel free to upvote that. Um, and one quick note before we begin, um, as I was rewatching the, the video that I'm about to share with you, um, is that early on in our conversation, Maureen mentions AAS, um, and this is reference to the American Antiquarian Society, a national research library of pre 20th century American history and culture, which is located in Worcester, Massachusetts, um, where Maureen spent time as an artist in residence. So I just wanted to give that little disclaimer. Um, and without further ado, I'm going to share our conversation. Unless, Maureen, you have anything else you want to add in advance? Uh, just um, your mention of AAS reminded me that they just went live with a link to, mm -hmm. I believe it's the past 25 years of artist residencies that they've been holding. It's a program that's unique in the country and uh, it's fascinating. So there are 25 port, um, I, I'm sorry, there are portraits of all the artists and their projects that have spanned the last 25 years. It's just a fascinating part of their website. That's fabulous. I will find a link to that and pop that into the chat for all of you in, in the audience while we engage um, with this next session. So please um, think, of, think of questions you want to ask Maureen and enjoy this, uh, this content that we are about to share. So hang tight while I share my screen. I'm also going to just warn you that my facial expression in this very first video clip is <laughs> absolutely insane. So uh, <laughs> enjoy. Okay, so Maureen, why don't you tell me a little bit about um, each of the three works that we're going to be considering today? Certainly. So the first is Anthropology. Anthropology was inspired by Samuel Morton's Crania Americana, a racist faux scientific attempt to prove the inferiority of Native peoples, a quote unquote inferiority of Native peoples by measuring their skulls. The mesotint prints that illustrate the book were so exquisite and lovingly crafted that I was shocked to discover what the book was about. I wanted to apologize for the entire white race. That impulse was what inspired the title and the next 10 years of work, gathering similar images from libraries across the country. The idea for that book all was also generated at AAS. Mm -hmm. I spent a month at AAS and I think about 10 years following up on ideas and materials that I found there it was really, um, for me, a very seminal experience being mm -hmm. there, being literally living in a library for a month and, and amassing all of this material, all of which interested me 
and then creating project after project for years to come. And that book, Anthropology, I don't think I finished that book for another 15 years, perhaps, after, after my residency. But the idea for it began there, racism. And I thought, okay, this is interesting. I think before I even decided to pursue it as a line of inquiry for a project, what inspired that pursuit, and I think what often inspires a project, is I came up with a title. Mm. I thought of the title Anthro apology because when I came to understand what Crania Americana was about, I just like wanted to apologize to say, like apologize to like all these people who is all of these dead people whose skulls were being depicted in this book and who were being used mm-hmm. for this nefarious purpose. And 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 Almost instantly, there was that play on words that came to mind, um, mm-hmm. anthropology. And a lot of my work starts that way, and I can't even say exactly why that is, that there's always this sort of double entendre and wordplay. I think it has to do with the fact that so many of my books are about the surface story mm-hmm. and then this dark underbelly. Yeah. And that is reflected in the double entendre title. Mm-hmm. So as soon as I had that title, I was just off and running and just started very actively and consciously collecting anything that I came across in the archives that would fit into um, into that title and this, this idea. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. About 10 or 15 years later, I had everything and, and the book came together. And it's also very fun because I went to a lot of different archives. Mm-hmm. I, I, I moved on from AAS to go to Duke and Brown and other archives around the country and would go up to librarians and say, this is what I'm working on. Well, what have you got? And, and not only was it fun for them to be participating, but then they also wanted to buy the book after it was done. So. <laughs> From a, a sales point of view, very, very effective. And if you notice, the book has these colored pages and that, and and very colorfully color, colored pages, you know, mm-hmm. a lot of pastels, and it's very pretty from a distance. Yeah. Oh, that's interesting in, in thinking about the connection to, to your um, experience, like looking through the Crania Americana first. Mm -hmm. Um, I also just love that each apology letter is is not only written in a style of the era as if it was written by the author, but also the the handwriting or the font that's used also mirrors that. And it's just such a smart, smart choice. Yeah, I had to do quite a bit of research just in terms of style of writing, mm-hmm. uh, literary style of writing of the time, mm-hmm. and also penmanship mm-hmm. of the time. And and I also realized that I, when I was handwriting the letters, I realized, well, I've got a certain hand that's that's this distinguishable and Mm -hmm. at that point I started hiring calligraphers or Mm -hmm. or friends to Mm -hmm. to write these letters and it was just very fun in terms of like how many people became involved in this project also interesting because people become a little confused about what part is mine and what part is bound Mm -hmm. and that interests me like and I'm often trying for that, aiming for that confusion in the reader viewer, Mm -hmm. for them to figure it out. And sometimes people do, and sometimes they need a little prompt. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a really, um, thinking about the 
the research process that you've undergone to create the work, it's it's not like you're just putting everything right on a platter for, for your readers, right? There is a level of work that the reader um, needs to engage with in order to, to really fully kind of like unpack and, and expose um, what all is there. And I really appreciate that. Yeah. It's demanding of your readers. And again, yeah, I yeah. Really appreciate that. It is demanding. And in some ways there's a certain amount of, of, I wouldn't go so far as to say trickery, but almost ambush. Like they've got to, they've got to work. They've got to mm -hmm. figure out what the hell is going on here. <laughs> I love that. So the second book, The Rapist, is based on the infamous career of Walter Freeman, a neurologist who was sing who single-handedly was responsible for popularizing the lobotomy in America. Freeman, who had no training, either as a therapist or as a surgeon, was allowed to operate on over 4,000 patients, many depressed housewives. The book, which is constructed entirely of aluminum, raises tr troubling questions about patients' rights, the abuse of institutional power, and the targeting of women. And as with many of my projects, it took a bit of time to figure out how do, how do I present this mm. in a way that's effective? Um, how do I draw the reader in? And first I started with idea of the circles drilling down into the right. That was the original concept. And I made a, a maquette with tracing paper, just seeing if that, how that would work, what it would look like visually. And it was fabulous. I loved it. And then I thought, okay, the covers can be aluminum. It's this really, really cold metal. Mm -hmm. It's reminiscent of all these medical tools. It's reminiscent of um, the tools that he used. He actually started working on patients with with ice picks, oh and gosh. and some of, some of his tools are 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 uh, are actually in a collection. And I looked at his his tools, his original tools that he worked with, and so this cold cold metal just seemed so perfect. And also that the metal was heavy, and the story was so heavy. And as soon as I I made the covers. I worked with a, a welder friend and he he um, laser cut these circles out of the covers. I loved, it was just so perfect. I loved it so much that I I realized in that moment, the whole book, every single page needs to be metal. Mm -hmm. And then another element of that project was that I was looking at a textbook that he'd made that he'd written in 1950 and that included before and after photographs of patients. Mm. And those photographs were so, so disturbing because this whole history was before the, the era of patient rights, mm -hmm. certainly before the era of, of um, the women's movement, second wave feminism. And you just knew that these patients weren't asked to be photographed. And so I wanted to use the photographs, but I didn't want to be re, re mm -hmm. these these patients, most of whom were, were women. So that was a problem and a question for me. How do I use these photographs because they're so powerful, so powerfully, evocative and and in in terms of the way they speak to what what he did to uh -huh. these women and how how to do that without re-traumatizing re yeah that's when i came up with the idea of the text running through the eyes and mm -hmm. so i'm rendering these patients anonymous and giving them back some of the protection that they should have had. Mm -hmm. 
um, at least that was my thinking. The last book titled Alienation Slash Separation was created as part of Swarthmore College's Friends, Peace and Sanctuary Project. The book was based on interviews that I conducted with war refugees from Iraq and Syria, now, now resettled in Philadelphia, in an attempt to embody the experience of dislocation and separation, I severed the text and reprinted it onto corresponding pages of four separate books. Since the structure is two-sided, with half the pages printed upside down, the reader is forced to puzzle out where to begin and in what order to read the pages. In this way, she experiences some measure of the confusion and disorientation that resettlers struggle with every day. I was one of five artists brought onto a project called Friends, Peace, and Sanctuary, mm -hmm. which was uh, envisioned by Peggy Seiden, the head of uh, libraries at Swarthmore College, mm -hmm. and it was a foundation-funded project that lasted two years in which artists worked with Middle Eastern refugees, specifically from Iraq and Syria, mm -hmm. with these families, and did so in order to tell their stories. I was working for the first time with human subjects and speaking with people, I really wanted to go in very empty, what the Buddhists would call empty. Mm -hmm. And and that was scary. I just didn't know where it was going to go. Mm. And I just tried to be open and to do what I do with a lot of these historical materials. I tried to see patterns. Mm -hmm. And pattern, the prevailing pattern that I saw in all of these stories of all of these participants was a sense of first alienation in their own culture mm -hmm. and then coming here. And, and of course, the book is two-sided. You turn it upside down. So there are the two parts, the part where they're, their own culture is becoming increasingly alien to them and then they come to a culture that truly is alien mm -hmm. and are trying to make the adjustment to that culture being more familiar and the one that they move inside of. Mm -hmm. And so it was these experiences of alienation and, and separation, uh, separation from family, from home, from language, from anything that felt familiar. And And so that kind of grounded me in, okay, I want to represent this experience that they've all had. It's a very, very similar mm -hmm. experience, not only in this group, but my sense also was in anyone who is a refugee or resettler. Mm -hmm. And the question was, how do I really, that was trying to really do something with this book that was much, much more visceral than anything I tried to do before, which was to have the reader viewer really have that same experience. And so that was the question I posed for myself. Mm -hmm. How am I going to get this reader viewer to feel that confused and that alienated and, and this sense of separation of, and not understanding language, not not being able to do something as simple as pick up a phone book and and find someone like read this thing or or go up to a, a drive into a gas station and read the instructions yeah. so and these were stories that people were telling me about about how confusing and disorienting it was so I wanted to replicate that, and that was my sort of my experiment 
experimental question. You know, if I were a scientist, this would be my, uh, this would be the question that I would pose for myself. And it, and it took a while to, yeah. to figure that out and to make a book that would just confuse the hell out of the reader. Um, in, a, in, a, in our previous conversation, I was uh, telling you the anecdote of using this in a, in a class setting where there were multiple artist books out on a table and students circulated around the room to look at them. And it was amazing. I think it was probably a class of maybe 16 or so students. And to watch each one of them slip the volumes out of the encasement and attempt to read the work and watching that sort of, yes, that confusion, that inability to access what was happening. And some students uh, kind of flipped through and then walked away, moved on. And then others really, you could see the gears turning and they dug in and they that aha moment of being able to connect the text. And then it's not just so simple that you've figured out part one, but it's this ongoing, I mean, and this in so many ways mirrors the stories that you were told and that are represented in the book, but but that it's it doesn't become, you don't unlock the secret and it becomes easy to read. I mean, it's still very challenging in what direction you trace everything. So it was um, really rewarding to, to see that and then to watch other students try to both offer some suggestions to their classmates about how to engage with them, <laughs> but also wanting them to have the struggle because they recognized and made that connection that the struggle is part of the reading. Um, and that was just amazing to watch that happen in real time. Yeah. So mission accomplished. <laughs> Interesting because I remember the moment when I sketched out a series of very small maquettes mm -hmm. that I through because I, I had this, the initial thought was, okay, I sever the text mm -hmm. and I have it be four books and you've got to, you've got to bring these books together the way the resettlers are the way their stories have to be brought together and the way they dream of eventually being brought together with their loved ones who they're separated from, often for years on end, if not forever. And, and it really was working and I was very, very, very excited and, and I was sketching it out in color and not the, the color scheme was coming together and the idea of these letters being being large, but then the text being separated. And I was really excited about it. And it took about an hour before it dawned on me that, my God, this is four separate books. This is four times the amount of work I've ever done in my entire life. <laughs> but once I had that idea and fell in love with it, it was too late. You know, in thinking about like the history of the book and all of the various different like printers devices to remind you about how to bind things that 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 must have been incredibly challenging in, in putting this together, which you know you want to <laughs> you want to, to kind of mystify, but that but there does have to be an order to it. So yeah. <laughs> yeah. The book binder who I'm working with is like her her eyeballs were kind of rolling. <laughs> So many of your works are grounded in, in, in looking at historical documents um, or sources. And, and I'm wondering how you found, how you sort of first found yourself uh, gravitating towards this um, as something that inspires or informs your work. Well, it was very spontaneous and synchronistic. I was spending a lot of time in flea markets and I was 
kind of doing what I call the tippy long stocking. I was just finding stuff and um, and very actively and consciously. At, well, there was a point when it was not conscious, when it was just what I was doing, sometimes to escape my studio, sometimes because something wasn't working in the studio, and there was this very lively space to be in. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that that was a kind of pre-conscious period, and I think a lot of artists go through that where they are attracted to something but not quite ready to own it as mm -hmm. part of their work and for me that was very much the experience i was going there and i was going there often spending more time there than my studio and and really being fed imaginatively in this place and there came a point when i said you know this has to be integrated into my work I, ha I have to bring this in and that was a scary moment because I didn't really know how to do that uh, eventually I figured that out and began overprinting on top of found books and then I was invited to well I applied to be an artist in residence at, at a American Antiquarian Society and I spent one there where there were a lot of conservators and archivists and librarians who were horrified by my slideshow, my introductory slideshow in which I showed all these works that I had, you know, overpainted and overprinted onto found vintage books. Um, <laughs> but I explained to them, none of those books were rare. Uh, I was making those books into something that actually made the, any reader, viewer, become more conscious of and more aware of and interested in very common historical material. To the larger question of why, why do this? Why go into an archive? Why as an artist would I want to do that? And I think there's something about, for me, that is very, very compelling about getting to the original source and being able to say, look, this is what was. This this, this isn't some histor his historian or critical thinker saying, this is how history was. You are showing rather than telling. And that's a very, very powerful thing. It's to me, a form of evidence you know, this is the evidence. And I think a lot of my work is very much like having a court of law set out on my drafting table. And, and then these materials become my exhibit A, exhibit B. Mm -hmm. You know, they're irrefutable. So that was our conversation. Um, I, there was so much content that we <laughs> had to cut out of that to keep it, to keep the 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 uh, I guess the timing down to a reasonable amount. I could talk about all of your books forever, Maureen. It was such an enjoyable conversation. So let me start out by thanking you um, for engaging me in multiple conversations about your work. It was truly, truly wonderful. Thank you. For myself as well and thank you for editing out my cat <laughs> <laughs> i would i almost didn't want to do that but but i did per your request um so now is the opportunity we have ample time for for questions so i pl please um shoot us a question in the q a um forum which is in the toolbar at the bottom of your screen um Maureen, is there anything you want to say before we jump into to questions? I just want to be conscious of giving you a giving you a voice beyond that. No, just please, anyone, don't be shy. This is actually my favorite part of the, of of exchanges like this, and I really look forward to hearing from people. 
Fabulous. Well, we do have one question so far, and it is from Paulette, um, and who is wondering, how do the interviewees respond to the final books of alienation, separation? I think that they were surprised by that project because it's very different from the books that they're accustomed to culturally uh, in Syria and Iraq. And so I think they were, they were challenged in a certain way as well, as well as my audience, my, my quote unquote art world audience or the American viewers who I, I was really making the project for. Um, and as an artist, you really have to think about who is your audience? Who is it directed at? For example, I did not include Arabic in this project. And that was one of the dis decisions I had to make. Was it going to be bilingual or was it going to be in English? And I decided that <laughs> Middle Eastern peoples, they know they know this history. Mm -hmm. they, are, they are drenched in this history. They are, living and dying and suffering this history. And it was Americans who I was really targeting with the work. So, um, so I think that the interviewees were, were surprised because the book is so conceptual and they're just not accustomed to, to work that is that, ex to, to books that are that experimental, but they were very, very, very engaged with this entire project and making books themselves and coming up with ideas for Swarthmore. And so I think they were excited by my work and by all of the artists. And um, I think very grateful also to be given the chance to voice their stories. I think that was the prevailing mood throughout all of the uh, collaborators that they just really were desperate to let Americans know what had happened to them and was still happening back in Iraq and back in Syria. Mm -hmm. um, I think I'm gonna go to Anna's question next, which sort of segues into this, which is, do you ever struggle with choosing who your audience is or do you have that in mind when you start a project? <laughs> well, I think we already, I, we already spoke to that a little yeah. bit, Marika. Um, do I ever struggle? Um, yes, yes. I think all artists, if they are really conscientious about their work are thinking about getting the work out to as large an audience as they can mm -hmm. and, and that is sometimes a problem in the book arts because it's not as popular a medium as sculpture or painting. It's not given as many venues. Um, so I'm always thinking about how do I make my work more accessible, but at the same time, how do I make it, you know, I talked earlier about this ambush approach and how do I, how do I really push the, my readers and and not just feed them my own thoughts or right. create a, a work of art that's very didactic, which I think is what I was doing very much as a young artist and what young artists tend to do. They have their own ideas mm -hmm. and just put it out there and here it is and it becomes very almost lecture-like. And I think that work is more exciting when the reader brings something to it and maybe a whole different interpretation. Um, I'm not sure I'm quite answering the question, but the answer is, is, is yes, absolutely. It's a continual question. Who is this for? When I was working on The Rapist, I was thinking very much about the question of is this just for women? You know, does this apply to men? Are men are, are men going to be as interested in this history as well? Mm -hmm. uh, and how can I engage men in this history? Um, how can I do a work that's about women's history and have men care about it? So yes, continually I'm thinking, 
how do I expand? How do I make my work universal? Yeah, I think it's such an interesting um, component too in thinking about the book as a as a medium too, because the audience is necessary to activate the book, um, right? And that the audience or the reader becomes sort of implied in the text in some way because they are the motor in turning the pages and put connecting the story, you know, so both physically and intellectually. Um, we have a upvoted question um, from Jessica, who asks, please talk about your use of shades of gray and your exquisite sensitivity to the levels of opacity and transparency. Also, how do you negotiate the choices of book formats, i.e. which format for which, which topic? Such beautiful work physically engages us so that we read distressing topics even more closely. And she says, amazing, thank you. Hmm. Uh, in terms of color, I think I often use, uh, I'm not sure what she meant about the shades of gray. I think choices like this for artists are often very intuitive and mm -hmm. maybe even hard to explain. I, I will say that I very consciously often use color in symbolic ways. For example, in anthropology, uh, I had mentioned earlier in our talk, Marika, that I was using very, these very colorful colors, like a lot of pastels, a lot of very bright colors. And I, I want, <laughs> and, and I don't know if the reader understood that or if it, it became unconscious for the reader, but I wanted to create this whole palette of racism because I was, I was choosing examples that were very blatantly racist, others that are very subtle, um, some that, and th there was also sexism in there and there was xenophobia in there. So it was like this, this whole spectrum of um, discrimination. And so I was using color in that way. I also use color to attract and to make a book look pretty and, and kind of lure the reader in to subject matter that's much darker and much more difficult. Mm. Um, I'm not, there was a second part to that question and I, I don't remember what that was. Um, oh, negotiating the choice of book formats? Mm. Well, that's a very good question because the form or the, the vessel, mm -hmm. the, the form of the book, the structure of the book the vessel that contains the text, the material, the message, the images is extremely important. And sometimes I spend a year or more just meditating on that and, and trying to think about what would best hold this material, what form, what is the form. And um, that's not a process that can be rushed. And I often sympathize with, with students and art students who I've, I've worked with and, and lectured to because they have these incredible timeline, these, these deadlines and the, the timeline for working on a book is, is so compressed. And that's really hard because time is an element in, in my process. I'm often working on several books at once because one of the projects I'm just waiting I'm waiting for an answer. As I was listening to the to our interview, Marika, I kept hearing the I was repeating the phrase figure out. I kept using that phrase again and again. And making art is a lot like mathematics. You know, you you have to figure something out. There's a problem and you've got to come up with an equation. You know, the form of the book plus the content of the book plus the research plus um your expressive use of, of, of skills and of whatever it is that's going to um, attract the reader, the, the images, the words, and, and it all has to work together, mm -hmm. this combination, this equation. Mm -hmm. Our next question is from Victoria, um, who, uh, um, who starts her, 
her question or their question um, by stating, Maureen, your work is absolutely extraordinary. Here, here, I agree. Thank um, you. <laughs> how did you get into the specific field of book art? Ah, oh. that's a really good question because it's an unusual field for sure. And people stumble into it um, often from other fields. And for me, at the time that I was in art school, there was not, there was not a sense at that time in the 1980s, or there was just beginning to be a sense of interdisciplinary art. Mm. Before that, it was really, uh, they're very rigid, you know, you were going to be a sculptor, you were going to be an English major, you were going to be, you were going to be something very narrow. And I resisted that I didn't, I didn't like that idea, because there were so many things I was interested, in. I was interested in women's history, I was interested in history in general, I was interested in literature, I was interested in art, I was taking all these classes at NYU and at at the School of Visual Arts because Cooper Union where I studied was really just focusing on fine art and I was studying Middle English and I was studying women's history and how did you bring that all together? And I, I didn't, I very fiercely resented this idea that I had to choose one of these passions of mine. And so when I discovered book arts, which was this quirky, weird field at that time. There were, there were no universities teaching it. There, there were no MFA programs. There were just these very quirky artists and printers and they were buying presses and uh, just, just owning for themselves the power of the press. It was so exciting because mm -hmm. I could do anything. And, and there was the visual and there was the literary, um, there was the his, whole historical, I could put anything into a book. I think there was also a sense of, I want to tell my own stories. Mm -hmm. And that might have been a very unconscious element because at the time when I was beginning, that's not what I was doing. I was making traditional books and I was using ex existing texts by, by well-known authors. I was working in a very traditional way, but I think deep down inside, I had a strong desire to tell my own stories. And after a few years that just manifested um, and morphed my work in a whole different direction. Mm. I hope that answers your question. That was illuminating to me, thank you. <laughs> um, our next query uh, comes from Deirdre, who says, hi Maureen, thanks for giving this great talk. We all know that exhibiting books such as artist books is a challenge because of security concerns. Have you had any of your books displayed openly outside of a case or enclosure so the public can turn and view each page? Uh, if that's Deirdre Lawrence, hello Deirdre. Um, I have always, always pushed to have my work free and open and um, able to be paged through. I, I, I don't like the idea of the, even the gloves. I, I don't, I, it's interesting because I am making these precious books that are expensive, but I also resist the idea of books being precious. Many of my books are printed in a way that, that isn't so precious. There are, I've printed a lot of books that are, I'm actually distressing them or I'm making books out of metal or slate or materials that might be fragile, but not necessarily precious. You know, I don't like the idea of you can't touch a material because it will get dirty instantly. Right. Um, so I'm always, um, giving copies to curators and librarians that that can just be handled infinitely. I, I, I believe that books are meant to be handled, even, even artists' books. Yeah, here, here. 
Um, I was just thinking about the when we acquired alienation separation, it was on view. This is the, the Bowdoin Special Collections reading room behind me. And um, at the beginning of each semester, we oh, oh, feature an open house to kind of highlight new acquisitions. And you, um, alienation separation was uh, set out on its own table. And, our, our community came in and was kind of going through it as a as an introduction to the work and so yeah I, I think that that it's a it's a challenge to think about how to um, put books on view to increase their sort of exposure to the world or and the world's exposure to them but I do I do agree with you um, I'm going to combine two questions um, from Dot and Roberta. Um, what themes are occupying you at the moment and spurring you to consider new work and what are you working on now? Oh, thank you for that question because uh, one of my regrets about this program is that because of, of time considerations, there wasn't the opportunity to show the, the work in progress of, oh, of yeah. work that I'm working on that is mm -hmm. about to be released, um, I would say within weeks. It's it's called uh, Newark colon, a narrative in black and white. And it's about the Newark riots of 1967. And of course, very, very topical. Um, and this is, I guess to, to kind of backtrack a bit and answer the initial question, the mm. uh, theme throughout my work, of course, is, is violence, institutional violence. And I'm thinking much more lately about men. I've done a lot of work about women and I'm thinking, have been thinking for some years and really trying to focus more on how to manifest work that speaks to the violence that men undergo. Um, mm -hmm. In this particular project, it's the violence that black men experienced at this time in 1967. It, it was a very, very strange and uncanny project because I began the project in January, mm -hmm. of, um, the very beginning uh, of this past year, of this year. And of course, within months, COVID happened. Um, at the very end of my research phase, I was going down to, to Newark every week and then COVID happened. And then these riots started breaking out mm -hmm. um, in, naturally in response to, to police brutality. And it was like watching my project that I've been working on for six months, like come to life in the 21st century. And it was just, very, very bizarre and strange for me personally, but I think also spoke to this other role that artists fulfill. And I'm glad I'm glad for this question because this is part of what got cut from, from our original yeah. time, Marika, that we were talking about the role that the artist plays. And this is one major role that 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 we are here for is to intuit or to almost in a prescient way either imagine or predict or in some way put out to the world what, what is happening, what is going to happen in some deeper, more profound way than maybe most of the population is, is, is ready to uh, open up to. And, mm -hmm. and I think it's also very confirm it, working on this project has been very confirming of my process and of my historical work. Mm -hmm. And I think it's so good that this is coming up in this lecture because the past is present. You know, I was doing this work about 1967 and I've had many people say to me, Maureen, why are you doing always doing this work that's about these other times, these other places? And I always say, no, no, this, this is this time. This mm -hmm. is what's going on now or is what is going to go on. Um, time is a loop and you 
as an artist, you are always looking forward into the past and looking back into the future. That, that's how it works. Mm -hmm. um, and it's so affirming to, to be working on this project now when, when it's just so alive and so real and so painful. Like yeah. once again, coming back to us so painfully. Mm -hmm. I look forward to seeing that work. I'm excited. Me too. <laughs> I'm um, exhausted. <laughs> I, I can only imagine. Yeah. Um, the next question that we have is from Jenny. Um, and she asks about more about the process of creating an artist book. You mentioned that you worked with a book binder to create the multiple narrative story. How common is it for a book artist to to also work with a bookbinder. What's the process like to translate your idea through another person for the final physical outcome? Mm. M many, many artists in the book arts are collaborating with, uh, with but I, this current project I'm working on, I'm working with two uh, craftspeople, very, very talented craftspeople, a bookbinder, um, and a laser cutter. Um, mm -hmm. Sarah Pike is the laser cutter. Lisa Hersey is the binder I'm working with. And these relationships are essential. I can't, I can't do everything. Uh, even the things I can do, I sometimes will farm out to a craftsperson who is more skilled than I am. I've sometimes had letterpress printers print books for me. I've worked with uh, glass crafts, Men. I've worked with um, metalsmiths uh, because I'm working with alternative materials. I'm working with slate, glass, metal, um, thinking about other alternative um, materials for future projects as well. I'm always needing to go to other artists and craftspeople who have greater skills than I do. Mm -hmm. And I think I think that makes the work very dynamic because they have ideas and they come up with solutions that I would not have thought of because mm -hmm. I don't know these materials. I don't know the, the techniques that they do. And um, that's an extremely exciting part of, of my work and my process. Mm -hmm. And um, I'll, I'll just stop there. Okay. It looks like um, we have time for just one more question and I'm, I'm really excited about this is a question from from Leah and I think it's just a wonderful note to, to end on because it sort of brings us um, perhaps full circle. Leah says, thank you for sharing this work and the opportunity to have a conversation. I think a, a lot about the circularity of works inspired by or using archival materials. There's something beautiful to me about artist books residing in special collections libraries near the materials that may inspire them. Maureen, have you had the opportunity to display your works alongside the archival materials or is that something that is interesting to you? Yes, I've. Um, I mean, that's another um, form of relationship in this field that has been so nurturing to me as an artist is working with special collection librarians mm -hmm. who are so brilliant and passionate and care so much about books and have been so supportive of artists making books. And um, many of them are, I'd say all of them are always looking for these very dynamic ways to display books and to also tie it into their own special collections, which of course is their mission statement to get their collections out to the world and bringing artists in is, is part of that. So in a number of exhibits, I have been very, very lucky to have had librarians bring out materials and pair them with works. Mm -hmm. And the one I'm thinking of specifically that really, really um, excited me as a young artist because I was just starting out and it was an exhibit of books, books by women. Mm -hmm. And then she was pairing these books with 
works that were in the collection and she paired my project, which I had something to do with labor history and may have been a book that I did about the Triangle Factory fire. And she paired it with a work by Cafe Kollowitz. And, you know, to be, I think at that time I was 30, 30 years old or maybe 29 to be in your 20s and like be exhibited next to Kathy Kollwitz because there's a relationship between you. I mean, it just, experiences like that really change you as an, as an artist and give you the kind of confidence you need to continue making work and, mm -hmm. and feeling that you have permission to make work. Mm. Oh, Maureen, I wish that we had more time. I um, apologize to those whose questions were not getting to their fabulous questions. Thank you so much for putting the thought and effort into sharing them with us. And my apologies for not being able to get them. I guess we'll just have to do this again, Maureen. Yes. <laughs> um, I Thank cannot you so much. I cannot express how enjoyable this has been for me. It has been so personally and professionally, and it is, I'm so delighted to have um, have you extended so much of your time and energy um, to share your work and your thoughts about your work with us. So thank you so much. Thank you so much, Marika, as well. I feel so honored to be here and thank you. And uh, thanks, Kat, Kat Stefko, uh, mm -hmm. once again. Yeah. Really. Fabulous. And thank you all so much for attending. Again, in the chat, you'll see a link to um, the Bowdoin Special Collections and Archives News and Events, so you can join us for future programs. Um, if you registered for this program, I will send you out a link um, to the recording of this program after the fact. So um, thank you so much, and we look forward to seeing you in the future. Um, and again, Maureen, thank you so much for your time. This has been such a pleasure and an honor. Thanks, Marika. Take care all.